it took us a little, just extra minute to settle. Um, so wonderful to see such a full house. Mm -hmm. So this is really, um, really great to see so many people here. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm Mavis Robinson with the Bourne Historical Society. Um, this is the second of our um, Wednesday summer gatherings at Uptuxet, and um, it's great to see such a, such a full house at our Lions Family Pavilion, so thanks for coming. Um, this is a wonderful night for us at the Bourne Historical Society. Um, when our, we recently celebrated our 100th anniversary of an organization. Our organization um, started in 1921 for the purpose of setting up this trading post to tell, at the time, the focus was the story of the pilgrims, or the English people who moved here just about 400 years ago. And, um, and as our organization developed and um, progressed and modernized, we realized that history didn't start in 1621, that that was actually more to history, and that history is a little more complicated, a little more interesting, um, and that we were really forgetting um, a major part of our history by not including our Wampanoag partners in the story. Um, I'm often here as a storyteller, as sort of a teacher, talking about what I know, but I'm really thrilled to be here tonight not in that role, and for our organization to not be in that role, but we are really here to learn. Um, because when we learn about, hear about people and their culture, we really like to hear it from the people themselves. So um, with that said, I'm so thrilled to have the, uh, the chairwoman of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe here tonight. She's also a newly elected select person, so <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> hear from her and that's why you're here so I'll turn this over to the wonderful Melissa Frick. Oh wow. <laughs> wow so thank you for coming out. I'm just overwhelmed with the amount of people that are here. I hope I can be loud enough for everyone in the back. Um, you know I, I, I got the slideshow set up and you know I always start our, our slideshow um, with obviously our name of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe and the Wampanoag version of our name is Sequana Makwapakwit, which means Herring Pond. Uh, listening to our ancestors and protecting our homelands, it really describes what we do um, now and today and on an everyday basis. So I'm going to forward my slide, um, do my greeting. So uh, when he Waniki Suk, uh, Natasuis, Melissa Ferretti, uh, New Tomas, Sikwana Makwapakwit, Kanatai Patuxit, uh, Borndale Ut. What I've said to you is good day. Um, I am called, my name is Melissa Ferretti, and I am from Herring Pond of Plymouth and Borndale. So I can't, you know, start any of my presentations without paying, you know, my tribute to um, my tribal council uh, because we certainly, uh, as chairwoman, I, I could never do this work alone. Uh, we have our officers and we have a seven-person um, board of directors. Our, our tribal um, medicine man in chief, Troy Currents, he's here somewhere in the back. And we have a few of our tribal counselors and a couple of our elders here, my aunt Hazel, my uncle Ron Harding, whom I love very dearly. And we have um, our enrollment committee um, is noted there as well. So I always start with the map of, um, and some of you I know are able to get a copy of that. So of course this would be a post-contact map. Um, of the Herring Pond lands. As you can see, um, you know, our greatest parcel was in the town of Plymouth, which we, at the time we called the Great Lot. Uh, the, smaller, the smaller lot further down was our Herring, our Herring River lot, and that's where our Herring Pond Pondville Meeting House sits today. We'll talk a little bit more that, about that further in. And then the, the Her I'm sorry, that was a meeting house lot. And then the Herring River lot uh, down below is the lot that is in here in Bourne, in Borndale. Um, to us it is known as the valley. So the divided lands uh, post allotment like I had talked about, and we'll talk a little bit more about allotment uh, once I get into the presentation as well, but um, was about 3,000 acres. 
obviously um, we all know, you know, the, the romanticized Pilgrim story and we all know about, um, you know, Patuxet and uh, Squanto to Squantum. We know about Massasoit uh, Osamequin, who we called Yellow Feather. Uh, we hear the stories of the King Philip's War. Some of you may know that. We hear Wampanoag people. But what um, many don't know is about the different tribes um, that are actually still here today and actually still live on their, their traditional homelands. And the Herring Pond Wampanoag Indians, um, we were called in the time the Herring Pond Indians, um, as you can see, we're still here. And I'm really, really happy um, to be here to share our history with you tonight. So here's another map. I, I won't read the whole thing, but this talks a little bit about, um, you know, how the lands that, that were originally supposed to be ours forever were somehow allotted during the allotment period and split up into 111 separate parcels. And um, this was imposed on us, right, um, as was taxation and all of those other things that were very foreign to Wampanoag people. So in this map I show a little bit, I just put some arrows here for the different places where um, meeting houses were either built for the tribe or built by the missionaries to um, obviously to propagate the gospel to the, to the Indians. So at, we've had three meeting houses that were built for us in, so far. One of them being the very first meeting house that was down in Borndale. I'll get to that very shortly. So brief history. Uh, we have a, a, an hour, so uh, obviously 400 years is, is a long time to put in just a, a, a quick hour-long presentation. So I always try to do my best to break it down on the short version. So 1655, Plymouth Colony, we all know. Um, the officials agreed to set aside lands for the Herring Pond Indians for the sole use as a plantation um, for the praying Indians which was established, um, also known as Herring Pond Plantation in historic records. Um, as, as we just talked about, there were several meeting houses built for the Herring Pond Indians over time. John Cotton, uh, being our first preacher um, to the Herring Pond, he, the first meeting house was built 1637. The dates are, 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 are it's written separately and differently in different places. I've seen it was built in 1637. I've seen it was built in 1687. What I always say, and uh, you know, I always try to make note, you know, I'm not a historian. I've learned this work from the time I've spent um, trying to educate the public and to bring awareness to the Herring Pond people. I feel strongly that there's no quicker way to um, to erase yourself than not speaking out. So it's been part of my mission as chairwoman is to really get into a place where I can explain and talk about our history to the public and so that you understand about the Herring Pond people. So um, the first meeting house, as I said, was built 1637, 1687. History's complicated, right? By, and, and in the support of Thomas Tupper and, and Richard Bourne, as we know. Um, they preach to the native. We'll talk a little bit more about um, him later. So the meeting house that's located present day is in, in, in on Route 20, it's on Great Herring, um, sorry, Herring Pond Road, and it's 128 Herring Pond Road. It's the Pondville Meeting House. We'll talk a little bit more about that history as well as we get there. So the meeting house, another meeting house, the second meeting house that was built, was built on the south side of Great Herring Pond. And stories are told that it was overrun by black snakes and that that is why um, we had to leave and vacate the premises. And that's what gave birth to our meeting house that we have to this day, which was built um, from, a, from an 1838 petition, also something I'll talk about later. In 1694, um, Massachusetts Bay government place all native people in, um, on reservation lands, as they called it. And it was under the authority of the colonial officials. The population at Herring Pond, living on the reservation in 1685, was recorded as 120 individuals. And in 1779, numbered 108. By 1825, our numbers had dwindled to 40 that were recorded. 
Here, here we are, a little bit about Bourne. So Richard Bourne and Thomas Tupper, as we said, were missions to the mission to the Herring Pond Indians. So this is a picture of many of you know, Burial Hill, uh, 1637 again. It says it there, 1637, but I've seen different accounts on that. I always say, uh, you know, history is complicated, right? History is emotional. History is fascinating. History is told by people, and it's often told, you know, very differently depending on who, you know, you're talking to and who's telling the story. So the Herring Pond Indians, who we are, are one of the three remaining historic tribes in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts today. There are other um, smaller bands and other, uh, obviously, tribal descendants throughout the Commonwealth. And there are other tribes out Western Mass um, outside of Wampanoag Nation as well, the Nipmucks and some others. History continued, just a little bit more. About 1700, um, the documents start getting written. And they are, um, you know, the Wampanoag people, we began petitioning uh, the colonial government to assert our rights over our reservation lands about this time. And in the 1800s, our tribal community, um, we were often under pressure to sell our wood, to um, sell our parcels for debt that we may have incurred from the guardianship that was uh, being imposed on us. 1746 um, was a critical time. That was when the guardians of the Indians were um, imposed upon us. So it was at some point, um, we say, but the Commonwealth established a guardianship over the Herring Pond Band, along with uh, Mashby and Aquina, and um, Gideon Hawley, and more, more well-known uh, is Phineas Fish. We always say he was kind of fishy. Uh, we'll talk about him after. And George Marston were just a couple of the names uh, to name a few. So the so-called guardians um, of our reservations. Now, 1790, critical time, the Federal Non-Intercourse Act. Um, it provided that no Indian lands uh, could be transferred or sold without fe the federal government's approval. Obviously, um, the federal government dropped that trust responsibility for Herring Pond because as we, we see now, um, our, our lands are are very few now and we currently have about six acres of what was once this 3,000 that I talked about previously. So the protection clearly did not happen. 1833, I just put this, uh, this date in here, William Apis, some people are very familiar with him. He was a Pequot uh, Methodist minister and he preached a sermon at Heron Pond. I love this. In his essay called Indian Nullification, he talks of becoming lost on his way to Plymouth, to, from, on his way from Plymouth to Mashpee. And he strayed into an Indian community across an in Indian in Sandwich, where he was invited to preach. Apis said, fun fact, I love this, in our research, as I said, um, as tribal chairwoman, I, I really am tasked with you know, learning my history, learning our history so that I can tell the stories, so that we can have the stories to share with our youth and our, our generations to come, as we say, the next seven generations. Uh, William Apis's daughter, Abigail, was actually married a Herring Pond member, something that's never talked about, that I had no idea about and just discovered in my work um, for the community. Phineas Fish, back to Phineas. So he was the son of Jonathan Fish. I don't, like, I don't generally talk a whole ton about him and Temperance Nye of Sandwich, which we know Sandwich at one time was born, right? They split off. Um, he was a graduate of Harvard College and uh, he studied theology uh, with John Simpkins of Brewster. So he was accepted and ordained to um, a pastoral office at the Pondville um, Meeting House uh, on Great Herring Pond and the Mashpee Indian Church. Uh, he succeeded Gideon Hawley, who I spoke about earlier, and uh, he was supported in part by the Williams Fund, that's another story, um, but he, and he was, a, that was administered by Harvard, so he was contracted through Harvard University 
to, to mission the poor Indians um, and propagate the gospel to them. So he, he, this is his transcript um, that he wrote. I won't read it to you um, in full. But, you know, he talked about um, it, it appeared that he was acceptable and that we, you know, the tribes accepted him at the time. He preached to the Mashpee, um, the larger Mashpee community more often because Mashpee was much larger than Herring Pond. And in the notes they write, he preached to the, whack, the blacks, the whites, and the Indians. And he was tasked with preaching to Herring Pond one-seventh of the time, right? Not very much. He spoke of in some of his transcripts that I've read of the difficulty he took to get to Herring Pond because obviously back then we didn't have roads and all of these houses and developments and such and he would as the you know William Avis talked about he got would get lost on the way right so Phineas um, he didn't preach very often to us so he was actually called out by uh, Josiah Quincy who was the man who was in charge at Harvard and he asked him for a report because there was question um, of of his services. So he was accused of misappropriating the funds that he was given, that he was supposed to be preaching to the native people, and he was supposed to be propagating the gospel and the Christianity to us. But what he was doing in turn is he was actually, um, he made his churches predominantly white and sort of drove out the native people. So he was finally called out for that, and once that happened, um, you know, that he was mirrored with controversy, as it was said, and he was boycotted from, you know, preaching. Uh, Harvard tossed him out, basically, and he was sued. Um, one of the small writing here, he was sued by Mashpee members as well for what he had done. He was called out by, a, um, we had a, a blind Joe Amos. He was the, called the blind preacher. Um, blind Joe came around and he stirred it all up and he called Phineas Fish out as well. And that was his end of his era, and he was no longer our guardian. So when we talk about the guardians of the Indians again, it was about the time, here we are again with the dates, you know, how their and history changes. 1788 to 1865 was what they chose at the, at the Mass State Archives, they say, was when these accounts were um, noted. So local elites were called upon to serve as financial overseers for the Herring Pond Indians and other tribal communities, they obviously, Mashpee, um, approving and rejecting disbursements um, from a tribal fund. So the account logs are housed at the Massachusetts site archives and they're fascinating to go up and read. They don't have them digitized because they're such delicate documents that when you go up, you know, you have to have a permission to get in, and they, they allow you to take photos, but nothing can obviously be scanned in. Uh, they're very, very important history. And it would be great if they digitized them, because then the public would be able to see them. So our goal, and some of the work I'll talk about later, is to digitize those ourselves and have them available, not only for our youth and our, um, our members to read and to review, and do research, um, but for all of you and all of the public to be able to read and see these stories. So the scope of the, you know, the content for them was, you know, they were appointed by the general court and they took, redistributed, um, and lease and sell Indian lands, of course, using the income to support the sick and indigent, indignant Indians, uh, and reported their transactions to the general court as they went, and the records would include an annual financial um, statements and, uh, and all the transactions. And then at the end, there was a report and some correspondence about the communities. So I, I, I went to um, archives. And as you can see here, I, I first thing I said as I get into the, the mass archives, I'm like, wait a minute. These guys are bookkeepers. You know, that's really all they did. Um, some of them were very suspicious. You know, if you, if you ever get a chance to go up and you can read the documents, they'll talk one minute about a specific name of a Native person, but then in the next document they spent $300 and it was an unknown Indian. So there was a lot of shady business that happened during these times. I love this one and this is why I shared this one specifically. So it talks about, you know, um, it's, this document is from 1865, um, January, February, and March are the accounts below paid $80 to Dr. Runnels for services. Uh, 
between 1864 and 1865, right? We paid Ellis $40 for supplies to Ralph Blackwell when he was sick. Um, we paid $15 to Theodore Hirsch for cutting wood for Sunday service. Paid, this one I always, I love, 90 cents to Seaborn, and I'm not sure who Seaborn is. I thought it was a J, because you know, if you've ever seen these handwritten old documents, it's really difficult to transcribe them and see actually what they say for books. So it just goes to show that, you know, the connection between the Herring Pond Indians and Bourne itself. So this one here I'm going to read to you. I, I found this one and it, it was not transcribed, so I had to transcribe it. But I thought it was just really fascinating as to you could read some of the reports that Phineas Fish and some of the other missionaries would say, and they talk about, you know, they call us paupers and, you know, the poor Indians and the beggars and the this and that, and they weren't wonderful. But this gentleman, George Marston, it was sort of when the times changed. And George Marston says, a lot of it's unreadable, as you can see. It's from box three, folder two, from the accounts of the, the you know, the guardians. And it says, the people of this place are in good condition they have the comfort of life in as good a degree as the surrounding white people. They have, they have land to cultivate, affluent of wood to burn, and some for market. And their houses generally are in good condition. They act, they are active and can accomplish whatever they set themselves about. Some make farming their business. Others go to sea and make first-rate sailors. They furnish more than their shared, their, their equal share to serve their country. In the late was, and they were men of valor, brave, always ready when called and found at their host. They have a good opportunity to educate their children, have an access to good schools. They learn well. They have a doctor by, and that's unreadable, one of their own choice. He has stipulated again, readable, for attending the whole population. They have a missionary with them during the year of their own choice, and they receive interest from the Williams Fund that we talked about before, including the use of the parsonage um, and house and outbuildings, which are neat and sufficiently large for the numbers of the missionary. Their house of worship is very neat, in good condition, inviting and centrally located at a pleasant place. Reverend George Carpenter officiated as their missionary. I'd just like to share that one because it's when the things changed, as I said. The, the, the accounts went from not very good to a man who was actually paying attention to the condition and he told the story the way it was supposed to be written. That didn't always happen. So we talked about Indian policy and the allotment of tribal reservation lands. So in 1850, uh, we showed the map that, you know, had the original 3,000 acres. So we talk about allotment, and a lot of people say, well, you know, what is that? So some 37 years prior to the General Allotment Act, um, or more people, some people may know it as the Dawes Act, um, concerning the plantation at Herring Pond, was intended to divide the lands of the Herring Pond tribe in order to impose individual ownership and small parcels of the reservation. So the divided land, as we talked about, consisted of three separate parcels, um, about 3,000 acres. So in 1887, U.S. Congress passed the General Allotment Act, or the Dawes Act. Uh, it was named after Henry Dawes. He was a socialite from Quincy. Um, and he was a senator, a politician, of course. And it was, it, it was its main promoter to get this law passed. So um, what he did is it, it was intended to stimulate the assimilation of the native people, right? Um, and, and by ending tribal government and our control of our common lands, uh, especially directed at tribes in this, you know, the Indian Territory, of course, in Plymouth and uh, in Massachusetts is where it started. So we talk about the Dawes Act, and it's the one thing that's always talked about in history, but what they don't tell you is that 
37 years before that Dawes Act was ever enacted and ever was a law, it was been being done here in Plymouth and in Bourne. And the Herring Pond and the Mashpee tribe, we were the test, we were the test case on that. And it worked because in 1850 they had already separated our lands, the lots were gone. They were separated into fee simple and taxes, and we were just made citizens of the, you know, of we were imposed the same um, rights, but we were also, in, you know, given the, the benefits of, of citizenship as well, right? So, um, a very important time, um, and not like I said, not well talked about because we only know of, know of the Dawes Act, and even a lot of the tribal attorneys had no idea that they had been practicing this here. Henry Dawes and the Massachusetts Bay government way before that, that Dawes Act ever happened. <coughs> so John Milton Earle, um, 1859 uh, to 1861, John Milton Earle, um, he was tasked with providing a report to the Commonwealth on the condition of the Indians throughout the Commonwealth. So it was by an act of legislature. He was to write an, an accurate accounting of the condition, which you can find in archives. It's online. Um, so Earl account counted for 67 tribal members for the Herring Pond, 45 who lived on the reservation, and 22 living elsewhere. He stated the median, median age was 24. Wow. And he listed a smaller number um, over 40. So regarding the reservation lands, I always find this sentence um, sad in a sense. Regarding the reservation lands of the tribe after allotment, of course, the territory of this tribe is mostly light and sandy and of little use for cultivation. And that the land that was remaining to the tribe after the 1850 allotment was unproductive of income. And Earl explained, the Herring Pond Reservation was formerly covered with wood, which had all been cut off. And being pitch pine land, none of the new growth had, attended, had attained sufficient size for cutting, nor will it for some time to come, as a fire had ran over the portion of it, and the largest growth a few years since had been destroyed, had destroyed the wood, which is large enough to cut. So what Earl was saying, to, to native people, there are no lands that are, are worthless. He said that they were, it was practically worthless was one of the words he said. Native people, we believe that we belong to the land. So nothing, whether it had trees, if it had absolutely nothing on it, it would have meant a lot to us. But what happened was that's the land we were given. We were given the land, we were allowed to keep the land that had already been all the wood cut off it, and it was non-productive of income. So they, we were told, here, you get this, we're going to keep the good stuff over here with all the trees that are still on it, and you guys can have what remains, sadly enough. So Herring Pond, Meeting House in Pondville. So this is an, um, the old Indian church from a postcard uh, our friends at Yale had given us. And uh, the Herring Pond Meeting House, the Pondville Meeting House, it was built from an 1838 petition by the Herring Pond Indians um, to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And we were asking to be afforded a schoolhouse like our, our sister tribe, Mashpee, had been. And um, this church is, uh, this was the center of our existence then, and it still is today. We meet there, uh, our tribal meetings are there, we have full care and custody of the building. And it's really amazing, and um, against all odds, it still belongs to us. So I, this is the original petition. When I talked about how you can see how hard they are to read and to transcribe, all of the Guardians of the Indians papers look like this. So you can imagine how long and tedious a digital heritage project that we're working on can be, because you have to find and uh, transcribe every single word and write it. So this is the original petition that built that, that meeting house. So at some point we were noted in some of the Guardians of the Indians papers as the Herring Pond and the Black Ground Tribe. We couldn't figure out what that was about. 
So references in the Plymouth County Grantee Grand Tour Index, right? It talks is about you know the Black Ground tribes. So initial assumptions, of course, were that it was a racist reference, right, to the intermarriage of Native Americans to African Americans. But a phenomenon documented extensively um, elsewhere in southern New England, however, it talked about Ernest Clifton Ellis. He um, offers an alternative explanation about that name for the etymology of the place. He said, black ground simply got its name from the low bluff in peat from an old buried swamp. So it's named, it's, the name came from the earth because it was black. Fun fact. So here's the um, 19th century Pondville Meeting House then. This was in 1928. This was a photo that's courtesy of Bourne Historic in the archives. It's actually these documents are in the Bourne archives and there are several photos from this event that happened. It was the first powwow. Many people don't know that the Mashpee powwow that we all read about and go to now was actually started at Herring Pond. A revival swept the nation, is what it says. And the, in the native people throughout the Commonwealth, they got together and this revival happened. And that was when all the chiefs and the local native people came together and we had our first powwow held at Herring Pond, at the Pondville Meeting House. So this picture here on the right is what we, it looks like today. Um, and then I'll go to the next slide just real quick because I wanted to show you, even though some of it's cut off, you can see the portion on the left side. Obviously in this photo, you see, oh, sorry, let me go back. <coughs> this photo here, there was not an addition on the other side. That was the original building, right? But when you get to it now, our building has this addition. So going through our archives, really interestingly enough, we found a document that was written from the Pondville um, board, the Pondville Baptist Church board. It was Pondville Indian Church at the time. We call it our meeting house. And because it was really an everything, we, we prayed there, we schooled our children there, we gathered there. And that addition on the left side, we found a letter in the archives, amazing. And it talked about that addition was actually trucked over it was an old army barracks from Otis Air National Guard Base. And it was shipped, um, the letter talked about, we've contracted the, the job to get our, our, our addition here from Otis. So they shipped that little portion of building, whether it was a Quonset hut, I think some people told me it might be a Quonset hut, we're not sure. That's actually a piece of the National Guard Base in one of the old army barracks, so I'm sure if those walls could talk, right? And how awesome is that to have you know, that history, those two histories connected in one building. So it's pretty amazing that they managed to haul that building over the bridge. And I can imagine in 1953, that was a pretty, pretty big um, undertaking. So Sacrifice Rock, I just want to add a little bit about their Sacrifice Rock in Borndale. So Ezra Stiles, um, he was a theologian and uh, he authored numerous um, scholarly publications and one, um, he was actually, he, he went on to serve as the president at Yale University. He also studied rock formations in Massachusetts, right? Go figure. So Ezra Stiles, he um, accounted, as you can see, you know, there's this drawing. It's, he might have needed some art lessons, maybe. But Ezra, um, he documented a conversation that he had with a Herring Pond Indian named Benjamin Seepit. Seepit is one of our, our names, it's one of our descendants, and we have family and tribal members that descend to the Seepits today. The Seepit name goes back to uh, John Cotton's congregation, uh, amazingly enough. So he talked about, as to the stone in the Plymouth Road that Benjamin Seepit told him, the Indians being asked about the reason for the customs and practice say they know nothing about it. Only that their fathers and their grandfathers and the great grandfathers did so and charge all of their children to do so. And that if they do not cast a stone or a piece of wood on that stone as they pass by, then they would not prosper and they particularly would not be lucky in the hunting season. Hunting deer, it says. But if they only, if, but if they duly observe this custom, they should have success. The English call them sacrificing rocks. Um, 
though the Indian don't imagine it's a sacrifice. At least they kill, at least they kill or offer no animals there and nothing but wooden stones. So the old fable that they talk about it was a sacrifice rock. According to Benjamin Seepit, he says that is not accurate. It was just a place when you passed on the trail to where you were going, you would, for good luck, drop some stones or something upon it. Pretty awesome. Just another map, um, Whitman Howard map, and it talks about you know the burial grounds once again. You can see Great Herring Pond down the bottom. The canal is there, and it also notes the you know the different burial grounds that are still in active today, and. Um, yeah. So this is the map I wanted to um, add. This is one I, that came from obviously born planning, and it was for a development, you know, unfortunately. But I like this map because it talks, and all of the trails are marked here. You obviously can't see them all, but the Megansett Trail is on here. And all of the little foots and all the little green spots that you see, those were all Indian trails and trails that we use for trade and to get to here, to Uptuxet to trade uh, here as well. So I really love this map because it talks about um, these things and it shows those, the trails. I wish I had a much larger version and my goal, you know, I, one of the goals as being chairwoman, I really would like to see us do a mapping project, right? Wouldn't it be great to have a, a storytelling map that shows, you know, just the trails and just the, the you know, the pilgrim paths and the paths that the, the native people use to, to get to, you know, from A to B, very important. So we're getting there, we're almost done. Uh, so self-determination and the preservation of land and cultural heritage today. So the Herring Pond Tribe, we're here today, but we, we now take the challenge on of preserving what remains of those lands, right? We talked about um, the reservation lands being greatly diminished through allotment, the allotment process, and um, lost, taken, sold. Sometimes by, you know, the land was sold because of debt that was imposed upon tribal members. I saw some accounts where a mere, you know, $100 was, was paid for 50 or 60 or 100 acres of land. And it was the only way to pay the debts would be to give away or sell your land or else you would be obviously um, in trouble with the courts. So, you know, these places are, you know, that are exceptional and spiritual to us are our sacred places, right? It would be our, our burial grounds um, and our Dynapath Cemetery, um, which is a six acre parcel that was it was called Discovered, but what happened is it's always been there, of course. So the burial ground is very old. It has seven, um, seven stones that are marked and eight graves. It's a six acre parcel in Cedarville, right where the, everybody knows the Little Red Schoolhouse just about. Most people in Bourne know where the Little Red Schoolhouse is. So when you go right down behind past the Little Red Schoolhouse is a ballpark, uh, Elmer Raymond Field, out behind there is six acres. And we petitioned the town of Plymouth back in 2019 and successfully, um, very successfully actually, uh, to our surprise with a 100% vote um, was, was deeded back that land. So it was pretty amazing uh, to see that because you go in and we, weren't, we had no idea how we were going to be perceived. You know, we didn't want people to think, oh, they're coming back, they're going to steal my land, or, or any of these crazy things. We're not going to put a casino on it, you know, that red herring, right? We just, we just said, listen, we just want to care for the people who are buried there, and we, we want our sacred land back. And Plymouth has a different voting system, as you know. They have a caucus, as you may know or may not. Um, so their caucuses consist of a lot of people. Each town has its own district, and then there's eight people or whatever that vote for each item. So when we got to town hall for this vote, it was very scary because we're standing there. We don't know what to expect. We got 100% of the vote. Not one person voted nay, no abstained. It was a let's give it back. So that was a pretty amazing. And we're, we're doing a lot of work on that property today um, where we're trying. You know, it's a really big undertaking, stewarding 
uh, this land. We've been stewards of it for thousands of years. But you know, we have to sometimes reteach ourselves these things because we live in, we walk in two worlds, right, is how we see it. We, we have our traditional, the traditional um, cultural things that we really, we really care about and that are important to us. But we also live in the, you know, the world that, that we are in now, in this contemporary life. So we, we adjust to all of that. So um, I won't read all of these. So these are just some you know, thoughts on um, how we connect our history. Doing that work, as I talked about, is a digital heritage uh, project that we're working on. We're working on a traditional ecological knowledge project, which actually you know, reinvigorates that traditional knowledge to our youth and to our, you know, our members to learn how to care for the land uh, the way we used to. Because some of these problems that we all face with climate change and all of these things, we didn't have those problems then. We knew how to care for the land. We, we, knew, um, you know, we knew not to do things to our water that would pollute them. So um, we have a lot going on and it, the work really never does stop. But um, every day is a new opportunity to do it. Just some photos. Um, some photos here. Lori's over there. That's right on the Herring Pond Reservation. And my Aunt Hazel in her regalia and my, my cousin Troy and some photos. And then I have a picture here and I always like to say this quote. This is my son. He had done a... a he did a, an interview with the Cape Cod Times on winter fishing and you know you, you, you sometimes wonder if your children are listening to you when you do these things right we all know are they listening are they glazing over and he did this this interview all by himself he didn't ask me for any help and he said if we take a second to remember how beautiful mother nature is we might treat it differently so I really love that because it's so true. It's so true. So just a couple more photos and we're at the end. Um, I was raised by an elder of my tribe, Verna Harding. I usually start with that because a lot of the work I do today is, is to honor Verna and the other, um, our other ancestors, my uncle Buster, uh, my uncle Tunney, my aunt Phyllis. She just died in 2019 and she lived to be 100 years old. Verna was 89 when she passed, and both Verna and, uh, and Phyllis, they were some of the first women to ever work at the Quincy, Quincy shipyard amongst the men. Them and all and several of the Wampanoag women from both Mashpee and Herring Pond worked at the Quincy shipyard. Verna was told to outwork three men. That's what, uh, my, uncle Peppa, that's what my Uncle Peppa told me. She always did labor, and she could outwork you all day long. Uh, and Aunt Phyllis was a love. They were sisters, and that's um, Uncle Tunney. He was, our, our, he was, our, he was their cousin. And uh, Uncle Tunney lived to be 93, and we just lost him in 2020. He was a great man as well, as you can see, giving you the peace sign. So just a quick photo of the group in uh, 2017 at one of our, our functions. And uh, quick, um, just some of our memberships, and that's that's uh, technically the end of my presentation. So, Thank thanks so much. I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. It's a beautiful night, though. Couldn't ask for a better evening. So, I'd be happy to take a few questions. We still have a little time. If anybody, oh sure, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, excuse me. The map you showed with the three thousand inches. Sure. So effectively, all of that's disappeared with the exception of a couple of parcels, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so we do, we're very lucky to have some of our family members that still reside on the Borndale lot. Yeah. Thankfully, my cousin Lori, she's out back. And, um, you know, my aunt Hazel retains a little parcel there. And some of our family, thankfully, still lives on that Herring River lot. And the only other parcel that we actually own is the six acres that was just deeded back. So yeah, three three thousand plus acres, uh, which was con as you can see, um, consisted of, you know, if we go back to the first one just real quick, you know, that great lot was massive, and it really contained it. It, it literally was. Most look how much of you know it was most of that whole area after through Cedarville, Manomet, 
So it was, yeah, so there's only six acres that remains. Very uh, good question. Dividing into the 111 parcels. Like, yeah. A lot of it. And a lot. And then once we were, you know, imposed on the fee simple, then the tribal members, and once legislation was passed, they were able to sell it. Um, the courts had said that the lands were never supposed to be transferred. It was supposed to be a sheet back. So if, if I died and I didn't have a will, it would have normally a sheeted back to the tribe and it would have been gone back to the common lands. But as time went on, it was even one instance where the courts gave the, gave the property to the mother, to the, I'm sorry, to the father of Mercy Wood, and he was non-native because they didn't want to get into the fight between the tribe and the other things. So they gave it to a non-native and just said, no, we're just going to give it to him because we don't know how to make the decision. So a lot of the lands were transferred very willy-nilly, and we really don't know uh, what happened. I saw one parcel that oh, my grandfather owned uh, that was taken for $18. Yeah, yeah, sadly enough. You had a question? Yes. Um, I can't remember the date that you talked about. There were 45 people counted. Yes. But how many are there today in this area? So if we took and found all of our descendants that live here locally, we'd probably have thousand or better. Um, but currently, you know, our, our enrollment is based on fo folks who come and want to get enrolled with the tribe. We have a criteria which leads back to that Earl report that I talked about. You have to be mentioned in the Earl report and a descendant from the Earl report to be considered for membership. So um, we have about, about 200 people that we have enrolled today. So we're a little higher than the number we were in 1600, right? Uh, but we're, you know, we're growing as we go. Yeah, go ahead. And that split between Plymouth and Bourne, I'm guessing. Yes. What's the split there? I'm sorry? What percentage of them are in Bourne? Uh, gosh, most of our people live in Bourne. I live in Bourne. My aunt, we have, we, it's sort of, we have, I'd say a third maybe yeah. live in Plymouth and then some, and then we have other members that some live out of state, to be honest. We have some members that are enrolled that, you know, might live in New Bedford, some of our, uh, because New Bedford was a big whaling industry, and a lot of, as you heard, you know, we made first-rate sailors, a lot of our members, um, one of our family, the Chummocks, they migrated to New Bedford, where the whaling was, in Taunton, in those areas. They just moved off reservation, is what we would call it. So, on reservation, if we were in Plymouth or Bourne, we're on reservation. Once we get outside of that, we're, we're still in our territory, but we might be considered off reservation because our lands were there. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, uh, you mentioned the word debt that you uh, you had to pay back your debts. What were you? What did you do to incur these debts? Well, it was you know the mission, the missions that they got, the guardians and the missionaries. They charged us for that for those services. They imposed it on us and then made us pay for it. So if we had um, one of the accounts I read was, you know, like I said, it was uh, 100, 100 acres to pay a hundred dollar bill that we owed the missionary for his services. Yeah, so any debt that we did incur would be, they would take the land to pay for the debt. Yeah, yeah, sadly enough. And are there, I'm oh, sorry, are there a benefits to the, to your property? I mean, if you're on a reservation? Tax benefit, any? Well, the, the Herring Pond tribe, unfortunately, we are state recognized. Um, we have not been able to, you know, uh, to get the capacity yet. Uh, and I say yet because it is something that we are exploring so that we can get federal recognition. So once we have federal recognition, we would be making our own laws. We would have our own police department. We would have our own court. And uh, we, we are looking to do that one day. And then we would be able to um, sort of do a lot more. But we do treat, we do act as sovereign, even without that federal recognition. And what I say is state recognition predates federal recognition. It was first. So if technically, if you think of it that way, right, we are federally recognized because we had our recognition way before they even had that. So um, it's a, that's a whole nother uh, presentation, but that's a good question. I saw another hand somewhere. What do you, what do you mean by capacity? What, well, what recognition can cost millions of dollars. I think it costs okay. the Mashpee tribe somewhere around eight or nine million dollars to get there. You have to have a team of lawyers. 
you have to have a team of historians, you have to have genealogists that work for you. It's a very, very arduous task. Yeah. You can get it through, there's two ways to get it though. You can get federal recognition two ways and only two ways, through the federal acknowledgement process, which is through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is the very arduous and expensive process, or you can get an active legislature, which could be an option for Herring Pond if we had the right support. But that's tricky, right, depending on who our president may or may not be at the time. <laughs> so, you know, it depends, it's, it, but it's, it's risky. But that's a great question. I saw another hand. Oh, sorry. I, just, I, I wanted to say it's beautiful to hear you speaking <coughs> the Wampanoag language. And it's something that's like so striking. I noticed it at town meeting. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about if you're involved with a, a language reclamation project and like are we going to be hearing more of the, the, the language? Sure, sure, sure. So the Wampanoag language is um, the Herring Pond Tribe is a participating community. I actually currently am the president of the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project. It was something that I took on because they needed someone to take the seat. So I've been, I'm actually at the end of my term and I don't know as if I'm gonna stay with it, but um, we are very involved with the Wampanoag language. We do have one linguist in the Herring Pond tribe who's a fully, fully um, fluent linguist. Uh, but it's a very difficult language as you can just hear. It's a polysynthetic language. So what it means is, one word in Wampanoag is an entire sentence in English, right? And trying to figure out how those pieces go together, it's really difficult. Is it kind of like idioms? In a sense, that's what they told me. Yeah, I've heard them use that reference to it. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, yeah, it's... Mm. So it would be the the way they the way it's written and like I said a whole a whole sentence would be one word. So it's very hard, yeah. Hey, yes. What is the connection with the Herring tribe with the Mashpee tribe? Is it close? Because I do know that I was chatting with a woman in the beach Hello, and she said she was teaching the language. Okay. That was part of her job. And I was wondering if you don't know, people from born, when we go to Mashpee for that, or is it disconnect, or what is this? So the Mashpee tribe is our sister tribe. Um, of course, you know, a lot of our histories are actually lumped together in some of the accounts as well. So, I think of it as yeah. One. Yeah, well, we were at one time, right? At one time, there was just Wampanoag Nation, and it was a, yeah. it was a loose confederacy of, a, of a many different tribes throughout with one general Sakum and then the different, you know, leaders. And we were matrilineal, which is always good to know, right? Um, you know, the women made the decisions in our tribes. So when the colonists came, they're like, wait a minute, this isn't accurate. We make, where all the men make the decision? We're like, oh no. So the women actually make all the decisions on, um, you know, land and uh, food distribution. Uh, some tribes, like the Haudenosaunee, a woman could unseat a male chief if he wasn't doing his job. So, so yeah, so we do, we are close to Mashpee and Aquina. They are our sister tribes. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, because I know they have that beautiful new building yes. down there. Yes, you know? their government center is fa fabulous, yeah. Yeah, so, go ahead. Um, I recently read uh, a book called The Mayflower by Nathaniel Philbrick. Okay. Are you familiar with that at all? I have not read that book yet, no. It's, I found it pretty interesting because it, it's, although it's titled Mayflower, it's mostly about the 70 plus years following that and it talks a lot about, you mentioned the praying Indians mm -hmm. uh, and certain Indians were loyal. There was also the selling of a lot of Indian lands yes. uh, yeah. for debt and other reasons. So it was pretty, uh, pretty uh, it was probably the most two-sided story of our history sure. and how it changed sure. and, and how quickly, uh, although the original pilgrims got along well with the Indians, mm -hmm. uh, within a generation uh, almost it changed. How it could change, sure, land, right, all the land and sort of those things, you know, it's like I said, it's, it's a complicated history and it's complex and as I said, you know, I, I mean, 400 years, it's uh, kind of hard to kind of jam it into an hour, but um, you know, it's, like I said, it's history is, it's told by, it's always told differently depending on who's telling it. 
And, you know, that's why I make a point to get out and talk to people like yourselves because it's really important to me that, you know, the herring pond is, def is often, very often, sort of erased from that narrative. And it's our job to do now to, you know, to change that and to educate people because if people don't know, you know, we can't expect you to know who we are. We have to get out and tell people and share that story and that history, especially here in Bourne where we live and where this is Herring Pond territory. The Herring Pond community was the only tribal community to ever be allotted lands in Plymouth and Bourne, and that's a fact. Um, so this is definitely a, you know, a really a good place to, to share this, you know, the history. So I really appreciate everyone coming. Go ahead, yeah. Are you familiar with the two rivers? Uh, I think one of them was the Manomet, and I do not, I used to know, and I can't remember it now, the other river. I'm wondering if they went through your land, the two rivers, where um, the tribes from Plymouth would canoe down to trade at Uptuxet. Yeah. If they went right through your land, because when I did a little bit of research, I think those rivers went through where the new school was built. Yeah, yeah. Because at the time, I, I had they were asking for names of the schools, mm -hmm. and I had put in to call it Two Rivers. Sure. <laughs> because I believe that these two rivers <coughs> went through that land, and I'm wondering, was that part of your land in, in times? Oh, absolutely. And the Manomet River is is like the we it's the Cape, we call the Cape Cod Canal is the Manomet River. That's what it is. So that would have definitely came right down through and it would have been a very, very important place for, for our tribal community as well as the others because even Mashpee and Aquinnah, everybody had to have a trade route and we all had to have a place to go through. So the Manomet River is definitely um, part of Herring Pond. We were even called in, you know, in some, we were called the Manomet Indians, you know, the, the Pat Patuxet and Manomet. You know, we all hear the story that, you know, Squanto came and he came and his, all of his, his you know, his, his tribe was completely devastated and wiped out. That's inaccurate. We, we just moved further down south, away from the colony, as far as the reaches of the border we could get to Great Herring Pond. So, yeah, Manomet would have been right through. Right there. Yeah. There's another one I think that was pretty much yeah. parallel to it, but I can't remember. Yeah, the yeah Scusset yeah. River. Yeah. 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 Scusset River. River, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very important um, landmarks, yeah. And, oh, I have a second thing. Um, you only have six acres right now left. Yeah. So that, that was, I heard it correctly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We have six acres and then we have several burial grounds that we, we care for. Mm -hmm. But we're working on that. There are some other places in Plymouth. There's some lands that we'd really love to, you know, be able to, re to steward and to care for. We're, we're, we're a tribe that, you know, we want to see conservation. Um, obviously, we'd love a parcel that we could put a building on one day that we could, you know, something modest, you know, we wouldn't put up a big giant building, but we would really love to have a parcel that we could build our own facility and have our own, you know, we could have our own functions and powwows and trainings and, um, and you know, events and uh, put a museum somewhere we could put a small museum in and be in, in our business offices for our, you know, our tribal daily our daily operations and things like that. So it's a dream come, you know, it'll be a dream for later and we, you know, we're working on that. We're actually going to be starting um, thinking about and we're in the very infancy stages uh, to create our own uh, conservancy, our land conservancy, a land trust so that people are more inclined to want to give you land and, and give in return land that they know that's not going to get built on or you're going to put a casino on it or something like that. Because that red herring comes up a lot. You know, we don't want, to, we don't want people to think that. We, we're, we're forward thinking, um, but we also want to conserve the land and care for it. So that would be our goal. Yeah.